I love you. And if you'll let me come into your heart, I will change you into something that's beyond what you can ever imagine. I can give you a life that you can't imagine and you'll do great things for me and for my glory. And I was like, Lord, I've, I've done this and I'm breaking down. I, I've done this, I've done that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, how, do I, how do I know this is all not just a hallucination like or a drug withdrawal thing? Like, How do I know? And he told me something that I had never heard before. I heard him, he, it, it got quiet and he said into my heart, you are more than good enough for me, so much that I died for you. And right then, I said, Lord, I'm not sure who you are, but I love you. And I know you're the son of God and you are real. Please just come and change me because I'm shattered and I'm broken. My name's Cody, um, 25 years old. I'm from Western Kentucky originally, but for the past five years, I've been listen living in God's chosen state of East Tennessee. Um, and this is just my story and what Christ has done through me. Um, I grew up in a small town called Cadiz, Kentucky. Um, grew up with two wonderful parents who've been married for 30 years. Um, I grew up in uh, going to a Church of Christ denomination. And from a young age, I had a, a what you would call a picture perfect childhood. I had supportive parents. Um, we went to church three days a week. Um, but the problem with that was growing up, I never, I never heard the true gospel. I never heard, I heard more of why should, we should take communion on Sunday and what we should wear when we come to church. And it was more uh, what I'll call pharisaical. Um, and that's what I thought it was. I thought it was more important that a person was baptized than it was going to church. They put a lot of emphasis on their doctrine. So growing up and seeing that when I got into my teenage years, I kind of was turned off from it and, you know, lived like a normal teenager. A lot of deep depression starting at the age of 12 and dealing to 13. Um, and then, you know, when it came to church, I, I started asking questions. I started asking questions to my dad when I was about 13 years old, like, you know, why is this? Why, why does, uh, why do we have to be baptized? Uh, why can't we go here and why can't we do this? And, you know, all the things I started questioning doctrine and all my dad said was, well, it's the truth, son. And that just hit me like a brick. And Church of Christ, they started preaching that only people of the Church of Christ denomination are going to heaven. And they used to teach uh, about losing your salvation. They said that if, for example, I were to get baptized and saved, and then I were to stub my toe, say a curse word, and then get in my car and go for a drive and get in a car wreck and die, and I didn't repent of that individual sin before I died, I've lost my salvation and I'm going to hell. And I remember hearing that exact sermon, and at 13 years old, I remember going home and I said, if that's the God that is real, that's out there, then I don't want to believe in Him. There is no God, because that is not a loving God. And I told myself deep within my heart, there is no God. And if there is, I don't care. I guess that I'm just going to do whatever I want. Life, I, lo I looked at life like it was a big Monopoly game. You know, we just get a bunch of stuff now and, uh, you know, get as much as you can and do what you want and have fun because at the end of the day, it's going to go right back in the box and it's all going to be pointless. I believe when we died, we died. We just went in the grave and we just ceased to exist. And I was content with that. There is, I've, I even said there is no hell. There is no heaven. It's all just stuff we tell each other to make ourselves feel good. And I was die hard about my atheism and uh, never told my parents, but you know, I, I, they dragged me to church, but I didn't care. Um, you know, played football, that, trying to find satisfaction, trying to find happiness. You know, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, started fornicating, premarital sex. Um, that never satisfied me at, at 14. Um, then when I was 14 years old, I was trying so hard to feel like I was enough for my parents, for somebody. And being a good kid and trying to get good grades and good at football wasn't the thing. So I just decided, I guess I'm going to get really good at being bad because at least when I was bad, I was having fun and I got some attention from my parents that I wanted, that I needed. And I, it made me feel secure. 
So around that age, I started hanging out with the bad kids, you know, like the kids are they're smoking cigarettes behind the school, you know, doing all that risque stuff we all thought was really cool back then. And uh, I started, you know, smoking cigarettes at about 13 years old. That was, you know, one thing that led into it. And then uh, when I was 14, a kid at school came up to me and he said, hey man, look, I need you to go to your house. And, and he told me what hydrocodone and other pharmaceutical painkillers were. And I was like, what are those? He's like, man, they will, they will get you high. And I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking pot and alcohol, you know, I didn't think like a pill can't hurt you. That comes from a doctor, you know, yeah, you're not gonna, like, that's not gonna get you high. Well, I learned quickly, I was 14, I took my first hydrocodone and I remember feeling a fall, a false sense. I know now, but this peace and this bliss and this, I felt so satisfied with myself and I was talking on the phone with my girlfriend at the time when I was a freshman in high school. And I remember I was just like so well versed and controlled my words. And like, I felt this confidence and I just felt amazing. There was no back pain. There was no nothing. I just felt at peace. And I told myself, that's the key right there, man. That makes me feel awesome. And you know, it's, a, I'm thinking it's a pill, man. It can't hurt me. It comes from a pharmacist. They give these to people like, hey, it isn't going to hurt you. And then that whole summer, was dedicated to nothing but finding other kids that had pills at their house, scamming them, um, stealing from my parents' medicine cabinets, stealing from my grandparents' medicine cabinets, had a little circle gang of kids just bringing me these pills because I knew that as long as I didn't run out of these and I took them every day, I felt great and I felt amazing. And that continued for a little over a little over two years and then uh one day i ran out and the physical withdrawals i didn't know anything about them i started getting perpetually sick and i i didn't understand what was happening but i knew i needed to get more and that's where it started going into getting deeper and deeper into the drug world um, when i started got my driver's license i was going to the town over in clarksville tennessee right across the uh, kentucky tennessee line and I got introduced to some guys that were in some heavy gang affiliation and getting around these guys and really having no friends. They really welcomed me in. Um, they made me feel like I was really cool for what I was doing and that, um, you know, they had access to all the drugs that I wanted and, oh, they were teaching me, you know, and these guys were like big idols to me because they're, they're, they don't have jobs, but they're driving Cadillacs and, uh, nice cars and like all the women in town like loved them and you know i'm like this 16 17 year old kid and i'm like just in awe of this and i'm like wow well, whatever these guys are into that's what i want to get into and i finally felt like i belonged somewhere and then that just furthered my addiction it went from a couple pills a day to over 10 100 to 200 milligrams of different opioids every day in order to just sustain me and then that's when I got introduced at 18 years old to amphetamines. And also at this time, I had started dating this girl. Um, she was a good Christian girl. Um, she tried to get me in church and I kind of played the part and I'd go every once in a while. But, you know, in front of her, I was living this life of I'm just a guy that's, you know, I'm working and this, that and the other and playing football and graduated high school and uh, went off to college for about a year to play football. But I flunked out. Um, and came back home and she didn't know it but behind the scenes i was selling drugs and doing a lot of them and she had no idea um but then it came to a point i got introduced to amphetamines and i started mixing the drugs together i started mixing uppers and downers and painkillers and uh that led into dabbling with heroin and then then i got introduced to meth and methamphetamine absolutely rocked my world it took me to a whole new high but the effects of it were so strong that I, I was literally destroying my body and I just could not stop taking it. And then when I got introduced to methamphetamine and started getting more affiliated with the gangs is when my life started to spiral out of control. And I think it's by the grace of God because um, the drugs didn't satisfy me and the gangs weren't satisfy me. So I was an adulterer. I married this girl and I cheated on her 
I, I can't tell you how many times. And I treated her very awfully. And I did not feel bad about it. Because not only was I in my what the Bible calls our carnal mind, and I couldn't understand truth or conviction of my sin, I believe God fully was giving me over my desires. And especially with the meth, it dulls your senses and it dulls your conscience 100%. So I didn't feel bad for what I was doing. I was full of anger all the time. And I was up for weeks, weeks at a time with no sleep. And that was all of 2016 leading into 2017. And then one one night, everything started to change. And uh, I got a call from my wife at the time. I was at this factory job that I was halfway doing and saying that my grandfather had passed away. And he was an elder in the church, a good man of faith for a long time. And I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. Didn't feel bad. And that was one key that God was putting in my mind of your grandfather, the man you looked up to your whole life just passed away. And all you're thinking about is, am I, am I going to be able to go over there and get out in time so I can go make a delivery or make some more money? I went over there for the first time. My parents had seen me in like over probably a year. And I had lost so much weight. I was about as big around as the thickness of my wrist. My teeth were starting to fall apart, and you could just tell. You could just tell something was wrong. And my dad had lost his best friend, his dad, and he just sat me down on the front porch. He said, son, whatever you're into, I can't lose you too. You need to quit doing what you're doing. I was like, dad, I'm not doing anything. You don't understand. And, you know, just responded like that. And then, lo and behold, two weeks later, been up for about a week, and uh, guys in the, in the little group I was associated with, um, I went to go pick up some more drugs, and I went to his hotel room. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, I knock on the door, and the guy opens, opens the door, and he pulls me in, and he's wigging out. He's been asleep for about two days, and he's like, what's going on? And he's high, and he's out of his mind. And I'm like, hey, dude, there's the, the police are on their way, and I am scared to death because I have had very few encounters with police officers, and I had good luck at this point, and I knew police equaled bad news. So don't. We got to get out of here. And as I tried to leave, he pulled this little 38 special out and stuck it in my face. And I, I remember freezing. And I had had situations like that before, running, running around the street. And that didn't scare me. But this time froze me in fear because I knew it was right there in front of me and there was no escaping it. I remember looking at the barrel of that gun and I could see the shine off of the bullet. And he had that hammer pulled. And I was like, this is where I'm going to die. This is where it all ends. But even then... I didn't have the thought of where I'm going to go after. I was just like in shock. And he said, stay right here. I'll be right back. And he, he walked out of the room. And I don't know how long he was gone. I know it had to be a couple minutes, but I was froze by something. Something would not let me run. My mind was telling me, your truck's right outside, Cody. You got to go. We got to go. We got to go. The devil's in my ear just like, you got to go. You got to go. And I have know now that it was God holding me right there in place because he I physically could not move. And the next thing I heard when I finally snapped out of it was, who else is in the room? And then Clarksville Metro Police Department walked in the front door, threw my hands up and started giving them this story. The guy, you know, uh, on the streets, you know, we, no snitching. We don't tell on anything about anything. So I made up this story. I was like, hey, look. I was just over here, right at, there was a Taco Bell next door, and the cleaning lady asked me to come in and, and just knock on the door and check on him because she didn't know what to do. And then the cleaning lady came up and said, yes, I asked him, that's why he's here. And I was like, okay, I'm in the clear. And they pat me down, they reach my pocket, and they hear a crinkle. They pull out a couple grams of meth, and that's when I knew it's over. And uh, I got booked on uh, you know, possession of methamphetamine. Then they searched my truck. They found pipes, scales, bags, lists of names. Um, then in the hotel room, they found a couple firearms that were obviously not registered. And uh, I got hit with about three felony charges right off the rip. Never been in trouble before with the law other than a speeding ticket. And that's where I knew that something, this, something's about to go down. So I got booked into the uh, Montgomery County Jail. And 
I remember the last thing I heard from my wife, I called my wife at the time, and she knew it, everything came out of the woodwork. The, the adultery, it's true what the Bible says about everything done in darkness will be brought to the light because, Lord, it was overnight. It was overnight shown. And I remember calling her and saying, hey, this is what's happening. And all she says was, well, I hope somebody gets you out. And hung with the phone. That's the last time I ever heard from her. Um, they served me divorce papers a couple days later. And say over the course of the next couple months, um, jail didn't change me. I remember praying that prayer of God, if you just get me out of this situation, I, you know, I started reading my Bible every day, uh, didn't understand it at all, but I was like, okay, this is what I've been shown. You read the Bible, you pray, and then God's, you know, helps you out. That's just how this works, right? So at that point, I had become a theist, I say. Like, I knew there was something, but I didn't know what. So I got out, and my parents told me, you're going to go get some help, and this is what's going to happen. And, uh, I had got my teeth fixed. Uh, I had to get 11, 11 fake teeth put in at 20 years old because um, the meth had completely rotted my teeth out. All my gang friends decided to uh, just run away. They were gone. I was left all alone. And they said, you're going to have to go get some help. So they start looking at faith-based rehabs. And I'm like, I'll go to rehab, but I'm not going to, with some very profane language, to a Bible-thumping blah, 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 camp, where they're going to shove the Bible down my throat. And even at this time, I'm planning my next great escape. And uh, I agreed to go. So I went to a little place called uh, Spring to Life Recovery. It's in Woodbury, Tennessee, in Middle Tennessee. And I arrived uh, April the 1st, 2018. And that whole week, I walk in and I'm seeing, I'm thinking I'm going to see suit and tie preachers sitting me in chairs at this little Bible camp and they're going to like yell at me about how bad drugs are and say, you need to be in church. And I'm like, that was totally not what I saw. What I saw were guys with, I mean, tattoos all over them. Um, seeing guys that were affiliated in the same association I was with tattoos all over them. And they were kind of rough looking characters. And I walk in and they're, they all stand up from their the little table in this living room and they're having a Bible study and they stand up and they're like, brother, we are so glad you're here, man. Like God's going to do great things in your life. And they started giving me this bill. They're hugging on me and I'm like, oh, all right. Am I being punked right now? This is a little weird. Like this is really odd. Um, that whole week I'm being forced to go to classes and I'm having a uh, man by the name of Bruce, uh, he and Adam Comer of Spring to Life Recovery, they're telling me the true gospel. They're preaching it to me about uh, repentance and salvation through faith and grace alone, and that there's, that there's nothing you can do of yourself to earn your salvation. And I'm like, okay, salvation's great and all, but like I got major issues right now. I've got this crippling drug addiction and this crippling adultery problem. And I'm an evil person and I want to fight and I want to hurt people because I'm just so angry and hate myself that I want to lash out and numb my pain and cause somebody else some pain. I was at this point in my life. Um, and something started to click in my head of like, what if you try to be sober? And I thought of it. I ran the idea in my mind of being sober. And I told myself it's absolute misery because I'd be left still with this emptiness and this void. Well, it was April 7th, 2018. They said, hey, man, we're going to go to a church service, okay? And I'm like, great, fantastic. That's exactly what I want to do right now. And at this point, I'm fully withdrawn from the drugs. I'm finally getting some sleep, so like I'm starting to feel normal again. And I'm just not happy. So I reluctantly say, yeah, I'll go. And they're like, well, you don't have much of a choice. So you got to go. So we go and it was called Experience Community Church. It was in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, still there. And it was a non-denominational church. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I've never been to anything other than Church of Christ before. And, uh, you know, Church of Christ, part of their doctrine is they don't believe in instrumental music during worship, like at all. They believe it's a sin. Uh, listening to K-Love, Christian music is wrong. Walk into this church and I am hearing praise and worship music. I'm hearing a guitar, I'm hearing a piano. There's people singing and everybody's dressed 
casually and I'm like, okay, this is, uh, this is kind of, all right, this is different. And, uh, still all I was thinking in my mind was like, man, I can't wait to get out here and get high. I cannot wait to get out of here and get high. Um, sitting there and the preacher got up wearing flip-flops and I was like, well, that's kind of weird. He got up and he said, hi, my name is, uh, don't remember his name. And, uh, I'm the pastor of this church. He said, but let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I walked into this church, Experience Community Church in Murfreesboro, and the preacher was talking about how he was a, a, a former cocaine addict. He said, like, grew up in a rich family. Um, the Lord saved him and changed his life completely, and he's been sober for, like, over 20 years, and now he's a pastor of church. So that really drew my interest. That took my attention on him because I knew that now I have somebody who didn't grow up as one of the goody two-shoes preacher's kids and has walked my in my shoes so i'll listen to this guy and he went straight to john 3 16 he said for god so loved the world and you know i'd heard that verse but then right then the holy spirit kind of focused my attention uh, he said he started describing what is the world who was the world and then he started talking about carnally minded men he said we're told from a young age ladies and gentlemen that we need to come to accept christ as our lord and savior and you do that by just at any point in time saying, I want to get saved, so I'm going to go ahead and just pray this prayer and this, that, and the other. He said, no, 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 no. He said, Jesus said, no man comes unto me unless the Father draws him. And he said, when you are encountered with Jesus, he said, every single mention in the Bible of somebody encountering the Holy Spirit their life was dramatically changed afterward. And he said, God is still doing that today. He loved you so much that not only does he want to save you from your sin, but he knows that your mind is carnal and it is warped. It cannot on its own understand the gospel. It cannot understand truth and love and compassion or any of the fruits of the Spirit. It's to the point where our minds are so warped and deprived that we can't save ourselves. And I was always thinking in my mind, you know, I got to get in church. I got to do right. I got to do this. I got to do that. But what he was saying is that the point of Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins was because he did something. He made a payment and did something that you couldn't do. Not only did he pay for our sins, but he walked a perfect and sinless life and he fulfilled the law. The law he was preaching was given to us as a schoolmaster. It, so he gave us the law, and the law was this. It was, okay, you want to be right in my eyes? Do you want to be perfect in my eyes and be reconciled to me? I can't have sin. Sin cannot be in my presence. You have to be per perfect, and this is what perfect is. I don't know that. I think there's over 600 Jewish laws, but if you just look in the first five books of the Bible, that's what the law was for. We were never meant to keep it. It was to show us this is God's standard. And there was only one man that ever lived that fulfilled all of those standards and all those prophecies, and man, a man by the name of Jesus Christ. And the only way he could fulfill those prophecies is because he was God in the flesh. He started talking about um, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, where he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by him and through him. He started preaching that. He said, God, when he made us, he saw through the eons of time and he saw every mistake that we were going to make and he knew how much we were going to mess up, but he loved us enough to let us not only make our own decisions and love him freely. He said, God doesn't want to force himself on you. God wants to you to love him of your own will. He wants to receive your love. He said, it's kind of like having a family reunion. If you force all your family to come at gunpoint, not really a happy reunion. You want people to come to your family reunion or your party because they're happy to be there. He said, that's what God wants for you. He said, he saw through the eons of time. He saw the mistakes we make. And he said, I think in my mind there was this little conversation between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, they can't do it on their own. I'm going to do it for them. And that's what the whole old he went through the whole testament of the animal sacrifices, what they were, what they were for, what they represented, and that. The wages of sin is death, as Romans says. Wages of sin is death. So something has to die, and those animals represented that sacrifice. But if somebody was to die for the whole sins of the whole world, for everyone that would come to faith in Him, He said He had to be perfect, He had to be blameless and sinless. Jesus Christ walked as a man. He, sacri he stepped out of heaven, incarnated a human body, 
He was a Middle Eastern man in the first century in Judea. He walked as we were. He worked. His father was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. He knew what it was like to wake up with a toothache. He knew what it was like to go to work every day and work by the sweat of his brow. He knew what it was like for a friend to betray him. He knew what it was like for everyone to think he was crazy. And he, yet he was faced with all the temptations we do. And even more, he talked about how he was 40 days in the desert without food or water. And when he was weak, the devil came and tempted him. And he used the word of God to reject him. He was perfect in every aspect. And he said, the people that he loved the most, his chosen people, the Jews, hung him on a cross. And he said, when he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. He said, what he meant by it was finished was that the plan of salvation had been completed. He died for our sins, and three days later, he rose again. And then 40 days after that, he sent the Holy Spirit down on the apostles and all who would receive him. So I'm sitting there and I'm hearing this message and it's ingrained in my mind and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and then I kind of look to my left and I don't like to embellish this part because not everybody has an encounter like I did with Christ. But I was looking at this mural and it was like a hand-painted mural of what, a portrayal of Jesus. And I heard an audible voice from within myself, like within my heart. It wasn't like God speaking out of the heavens. You know, it was like something from within me. That small, still voice got like a little louder. And I heard a voice just like I was talking to me and you. And I couldn't really describe the voice in like normal terms, but I could understand it. It called me by name and it said, Cody. I said, yes. And this was all in my mind. And he said, I have loved you since before you were born. He said, I know everything about you. I know everything you've done, good and evil. He said, I know you're broken right now. You can't fix yourself. You can't change yourself. He said, I love you. And if you'll let me come into your heart, I will change you into something that's beyond what you can ever imagine. I can give you a life that you can't imagine. And you'll do great things for me and for my glory. And I was like, Lord, I've, I've done this, and I'm breaking down. I, I've done this, I've done that. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, how, do I, how do I know this is all not just a hallucination like or a drug withdrawal thing? Like, How do I know? And he told me something that I had never heard before. I heard him. He, it, it got quiet, and he said into my heart, you are more than good enough for me, so much that I died for you. And right then, I said, Lord, I'm not sure who you are. But I love you, and I know you're the Son of God, and you are real. Please just come and change me because I'm shattered and I'm broken. And right then, man, it, it was an insane physical feeling. It was really amazing. I really did feel like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And what I recognize that feeling as now, as I've studied and as I've walked with God, is that was love, absolute love, entering into me for the first time ever. It wasn't like love that I had for my parents. It was an agape love, an eternal love. And I felt fully at peace with God. And at this time, I'm facing, I'm on bond. So I'm potentially facing some very serious prison time at 20 years old. And I wasn't worried about it at all. I knew that everything, no matter what, was going to be okay. And I remember getting back to the, to the rehab and I talked to the guys. I said, I don't know what happened, but something something's changing. I woke up the next morning and a weird thing happened. I went to go make some coffee at the little coffee maker and I spilled all the coffee grains on the ground. And like, I used to really love the F word. It was my favorite adjective verb noun. And uh, as I went to say it, uh, something like within me was like, it literally felt like somebody was grabbing my like esophagus. And it was like a, this deep feeling of like, this is wrong. Like, don't say that. I was like, oh, okay, all right, that's, that's really, that's weird. That's whatever, man, okay. And then they decided to take us to the community center. So they had like a pool inside. So like after we did our Bible class, we went and uh, we were in there. And these guys, some of the guys were talking about a man and his wife were there. And they were talking about how, you know, how beautiful she is. And, you know, guys are, they're talking like that. And something in my, like, just snapped off. And I said, dude, that's somebody's wife, dude. Like, you you, ain't, you you can't be looking at, you can't be talking to her like that or talking about her like that. And then that's when I really sat back and I was like, whoa, like, some things are happening. 
I didn't have any thoughts of like drugs. Like when I did think about them, it like it was physically making me sick, like or really like really sick, and I was like terrified of the thought of getting high. And I was like, what's going on? So I broke down in tears and went to the pastor. And I said, like, Adam, what's going on, man? Like, I explained all this to him. And he leaned over and he hit me right here on the forehead. And he said, you got saved, dummy. He said, like, but like, what, what about all these changes? And he went through and he opened scripture. And he said, you know, when he sent down his Holy Spirit, you know, he, God does not dwell in, you know, temples made with human hands. He dwells within us. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, he said, you're starting to experience the fruits of the Spirit, Cody. Like, he's changing your mind. He said, that's what the part of salvation nobody talks about, Cody. Like, yes, you don't. You get eternal life. You're eternally secure. He, you know, reassured me of my salvation. But, like, he said, God's not going to allow you to live in this lifestyle or this mindset anymore. He's going to give you a Christ-like mindset. And he said, now this is where the real work begins. And he went over spiritual warfare. And, like, man, I was just like a sponge for those days. I absorbed all this information. And, uh. I, I was just in love with God's word. I was in love with it. Um, but I was still fighting that carnal mindset. Went back home. Uh, knew I shouldn't have gone back home. And then um, walking with the Lord uh, three months later, fell into temptation and relapsed. And then as I relapsed, I found Miracle Lake in Etowah, Tennessee, where we're near right now. And uh, came down here, went through the program because the God told me, go to Tennessee and don't ever come back. And I did. I came down, went through the program and they had just so happened to have a transition house. So I was like, I had a place to stay and I got a job here and God continued to work on me. I continued like, there, there weren't the same sins. There were some sins in my life that I still struggled with. I struggled with lust that with at that time was lust, you know, how to navigate relationships. But every single time God put good men in my life to guide me to show me the way and i had to relearn everything i had to learn how to talk to people i had to learn how to uh, be an honest worker god blessed me with a work ethic i remember you had to just drag me to go do anything if it wasn't quick money i wasn't doing it but now he gave, he gave me this work ethic and he put me in places and situations to where i could witness to other people he put a good church family around me and everything around me just started to encompass and it was all about him in every aspect of my life. I realized quickly, you can't be half in and half out. And then a little over a year ago, I was been sober for three and a half years and I got to the point in my spiritual walk where I thought I got it. I made it good. You know, I stopped reading my Bible as much. I started to stop dividing his word. I stopped, uh, paying attention in church so much because I feel like I got this. I'm good. I'm content. I feel like a lot of Christians run into that. They feel like they're good and they're content and they got this. You know, I don't have to read my Bible every day. I don't have to be involved in ministry. I don't have to be involved in witnessing to people. I don't have to, uh, you know, bring this into my home. You know, my wife at the time, um, we're good. We can just go to church and we're, we're doing fine. I'm secure. Well, that's what the devil likes to do. He wants you to make you feel like you're okay, you're content, and that you don't have to, like a marriage, it's a lot like your relationship with the Lord. It's two ways. You have to pursue God. And he should put that desire in your heart, and he does. But the more you start living in sin and living in the world, it kind of calluses over that feeling and your carnality and your natural man starts to take over. That's what happened to me. And uh, after I got married in October of 2021, um, it was about a three, four month of backsliding. I allowed one thing, and it was one drink of alcohol into my life. That's nah, not bad. It's not drugs. You know, I'm just having one beer. We're on vacation. It's not that bad. Well, as soon as I opened that door to any sin, to sin into my life, it took over. Started drinking every day. Started drinking at night. And then, lo and behold, I call it your default sin. Everybody's got their own default sin. Mine was meth, and it got put right in front of me. One week. Did it for one week. And woke up in Sweetwater Hospital. Almost dead. Both my kidneys shut down. Pneumonia in both lungs. My heart rate was very, very, very low, and I was not about to make it. That was closest, one of the closest times to death I've ever been. And right then, the Holy Spirit told me, you got one more chance, Cody. you got one more chance. And I was so concerned about, man, what are people going to think of me? I've been clean for three and a half years. I've been walking with the Lord. I've laid down my gang affiliation. I do jail ministry. I'm doing this. What are people going to think of me? And then I had this revelation. It ain't about me. It's about Him. And that God does not save somebody for nothing. He doesn't cast you to the side. There's always something, and there's a great plan for your life. So 
I went back through Miracle Lake. I went back through the program and reaffirmed my relationship with God. And one thing I had to learn was that I cannot do this on my own. Of myself, I can do nothing. By His grace and through His continuing sanctification, the Bible says, and this is God's will for your life, comma, your sanctification. Growth in the Spirit. Growth in your knowledge of Him, your love for Him, and your personal daily walk with Him. That's what His goal is. His goal is to mold you and shape you into more of Him and less of you. But that takes laying aside everything and fully surrendering everything in your life. And that's hard to do. And now looking back with another year of sobriety under my belt, He restored my marriage. He restored my hope in myself and in Christ and what He's going to do in my life. He's completely rid me of all guilt of everything I had done, and He's just magnified His glory in everything. My home is stronger. I'm actually a spiritual leader in the house. I have a son on the way, and now I'm being blessed with an opportunity to raise him a way that I wasn't raised. That I can, like the Bible says, raise up a child in the ways of the Lord, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's an amazing blessing. I'm surrounded by good friends who are also involved in ministry. I have a great church family. And God, every day He wakes me, when I wake up, He is reminding me that He is there, He is in control, and He's continuing to change me. And on April 7th, 2018, at 7.37 p.m., that promise that He made me, He's never broken. He's never let me down. He's never forsaken me. He completely changed everything about me and continuing to change me. And uh, you know, to anybody watching this, I hope that maybe this touches you, but it's not about me. It's about God, and God loves you. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God wants you to repent. Repent comes from the Greek word metanoios. means to change your mind. Change of mind that leads to a change of action. When the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you and if you feel Him tugging at your heart, you need to say to yourself, I don't want to be this way anymore. I'm a sinner and I'm falling short of grace. And there's a God who loves you. If you ask Christ to come into your heart, He will send His Holy Spirit to be your comforter. See, even the apostles were worried that when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, He said, Where I go, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I may be, you may be also. But He said, I will send the comforter. He sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, and He comes down on everyone who asks Christ into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. He wants you to repent, turn away from your sin, he wants you to accept Him as your Savior and submit your whole life to Him. And then I'd highly recommend if that happens to you, find a good Bible-believing church and find a group of believers that we can walk through this life together and God's going to put people and places in your life. Just surrender to Him and I promise you, you'll never be the same. He's given me a life, like He said, that I am extremely thankful for. And one day I get to share a home in heaven with Him. There's freedom from addiction. There's freedom from not just drugs, but we're all addicted to something. Lust, uh, relationships, codependency. If he can heal me and take that crippling addiction that overtook my life away from me and change me into what he's made me today, he can do the same for you.